Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you're, you're joining from. Uh, I hope that you have all been enjoying the amazing lineup of programs uh, thus far for the Deaf Visual Arts Festival. I'm delighted to welcome you to a virtual tour of the Mildred Lane Kemper Art Museum. My name is Meredith Lehman, and I'm the head of museum education at the Kemper Art Museum at Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, I want to first acknowledge that we at the Kemper Art Museum in St. Louis are meeting on the ancestral lands of the Osage Nation, Missouri, and Alaimi Confederacy, and many other tribes who were unjustly removed. We recognize these communities as we live, work, study and benefit from this land. I also want to take a moment to thank the wonderful organizers of the Deaf Visual Arts Festival, Deaf Inc., for the opportunity to collaborate. A warm thank you to Tony Nitko for all his work on this program and for connecting me with uh, Meredith Gray Green and all of you uh, tonight. Thank you also to our interpreters, Debbie and Melissa, uh, who are joining us on this Zoom. Tonight's tour will explore works in a range of mediums by artists whose work brings attention to social, political, and environmental issues. The tour will focus on the site-specific mural Stacking Traumas by artist Christine Soon Kim, whose work considers how sound operates in society from her perspective as part of the deaf community. Just to go over a little bit of Zoom housekeeping, we are recording the tour and we'll share that on our YouTube channel for those who are unable to attend tonight um, or if you wanna rewatch or share the tour with anyone. Uh, and we also have live captions. Um, if you want to see those, those are often located on the bottom of your screen on most devices. The chat feature is also open for you to connect with other attendees. So please, um, if you want to make sure that it is set to all panelists and attendees, that way you can um, interact with the group. And at various points in the tour, Meredith Gray Green will invite you to share observations on artworks through the chat. Uh, and if we want to just test it out and make sure that it's working for everyone, um, if you'd like to put in the chat where you're joining from, that way we can get a sense of um, the various uh, parts of the country where, we're, um, where, we, where we call home. Uh, at the end of the tour, there will also be time for a Q&A, so we'll ask you to submit your questions using the Q&A feature, so both the Q&A and chat functions are um, often on the bottom of, of your devices. Um, I see some stuff coming in the chat. We have hello from St. Louis, Delaware, Tucson, Edwardsville, Illinois, another um, person joining from Arizona, St. Louis, South Carolina, wow all over, this is wonderful. Um, I'd now uh, like to introduce our presenter, Meredith Gray Green. Meredith Gray Green is a deaf and hard of hearing artist, interpreter, and educator. She grew up in mid-Missouri in a large college town. After graduating from Columbia College with a degree in drawing and painting, she continued to earn her, to earn her interpreter certification and a master of arts in teaching. Her graduate thesis centered on language assessment and early childhood deaf education. Green has always had a passion for working with the community, especially with children. She has worked in educational institutions from preschool to graduate school and frequently volunteers her time and talents with the deaf community. You can find her interpreting body pirate songs, at the Renaissance Fair, teaching art to deaf youth at a summer camp or collaborating with other artists at a music festival. Uh, and I'll just add that it's been really wonderful to work with you, Meredith Gray Green, um, on, on this tour. So with that, I will hand it over to you to get started. Thank you so much. All right, hello everyone. And thank you so much for joining us tonight. Really means a lot. I really wish we could all get together in person. 
So I'm hoping in the future we will be able to come together and meet in person. So to learn and appreciate art and to visit our museum together. And Dr. Lehman, it was a huge um, pleasure to work with you for this presentation. And I've really been, I was really honored that Tony Nitko asked me to uh, provide this American Sign Language or ASL tour. So because this tour is virtual, we're able to access a broader selection of works from the collection here at the Kemper Museum. Many of the works we'll be looking at tonight are not actually on display in the museum. They're actually in storage at this present time in the archives. There is an exception to that. There are two pieces we'll be looking at that are actually on display right now. One is an amazing mural that is in the museum right now by Christine Sun Kim. And we will actually be talking a lot about that piece this evening. And then we also have another fascinating piece, a sculpture that is located in the lobby of the Kemper Museum. We really hope this tour is interactive. So I know I'm not able to see your faces. So I invite you all to share your thoughts, ideas, reactions throughout this hour via the comment section. We also have a Q&A at the end of this tour. So if there are any questions that come to mind, go ahead and put those in the Q&A section. And then at the end of the tour, we will go ahead and bring all of those questions up and give them their answers. All right. This museum was founded in 1881 as the St. Louis School and Museum of Fine Arts, located in a department of Washington University. The museum's first location was in a really old neo-Renaissance style building in downtown St. Louis. Over the years, the museum collection has had several different homes, including the World's Fair in 1904. And that building is now today the St. Louis Art Museum. And the museum moved to its current location in, where was I at, 2006. The designer won an award called the Pritzker Prize. And that was the architect of this building. And their name was Fumihiko Maki. In 2019, the museum underwent an expansion with new gallery spaces and performance spaces. That included the new lobby that you see in this photograph. The museum's collection is primarily focused on 19th and 20th century American and European art by artists working in a range of mediums and practices. Now we will venture inside to look more closely at the installation that greets visitors when they first enter the building. The first piece we are going to admire is visible from outside the museum and at the entrance to the museum. So when you walk up to the museum on the campus of Washington University, you will notice 
the outside of the museum is two stories of glass. And through that, you can see this amazing light infused sculpture that's suspended from a high ceiling. I also wanted to let you know, I was al already in the building and I looked at this during, during break. So I, I'm inviting you now to take a look at the sculpture. And the sculpture is from, uh, the sculpture, the, the person that made it is from Argentina. And I, when you take a look at it, think of any words that pop up. And what does it look like? What does it represent in, in the picture? And you can just use your imagination. What does it look like? Um, we're gonna, you can, you can just, we'll post a link in the chat and then you can hit that. And then when you do that, it'll, it'll bring up a slide and have a word cloud there. And you can type in your own word. So go ahead and visit the link. And then we'll go back to the presentation. And then we can discuss, you know, what people type in, what words they've added. Oh, I see some here in the cloud. Ah, sun setting, bubbles. Beehive, good. Hmm. Oh, white rice, ice cubes, rainbow, rainbow ice cubes. That's interesting. Any more? Okay. That's cool. Really, um, I like what someone said about worldwide connection. That was impactful. That was right on target. Next. This artist had this vision of the sculpture and it's just amazing. He's from Argentina and his work is just layered on so many different ways in, in architecture, natural sciences, environmental sciences and his study and work in um, spiders. He actually kept a spider in his studio in a jar, in a glass jar while he was working. And he would look at the spider and see how he would make the web and observe the, the spider and see how the spider would connect the webs together and kind of imitate that in his art. I admit I'm terrified of spiders, <laughs> but I gotta tell you, their, their alien energy is amazing. And the way they build in, in their technology is just, unbelievable. It's simple and strong. Really what's interesting is that he was imagining a futuristic utopia and he gave it a name, the airport city. And the city was characterized by using unlimited solar energy, connectivity, levity. And this all relates to his vision of a future society that was able to move freely about in space, connecting and then reconnecting the cells. The idea is that in the distant future, humans would live in structures like these. Hmm. 
and our lives would be with no limit, limitless, interconnected, collective, and inclusive. Now, as we round the corner in the center of the museum, we arrive at the mural by Christine Sum Kim. If you can imagine yourself standing there and looking up at the wall onto your right, you'll notice she designed this mural for a very tall curved wall that's reflected there in this specific wall. And the ball is the silver ball suspended from the ceiling. Can you see that? All right. And a, a little bit about Kim. She's a famous artist and her work has just been, had so much attention to the deaf community and related subjects to the deaf. Her latest work has a simple black and white style often used in music notes. And Christine has two masters of fine arts degrees, one in visual art and the other is in sound and music, which <laughs> that's really interesting. Uh, it's an interesting field of study for a profoundly deaf person. The mural um, is got a strong has a strong emotional response, and I'm just I, I I've had this experience myself in struggling with challenges that deaf people have. It's called stacking traumas, and I've had these ha things happen to myself. And people who see this mural. And the, they experience what they see. My hope is they understand the trauma that deaf people have been through. I would also like to discuss the art's impact. And what do you notice about the murals? about the mural and the, it, how it fits in this space. You can go ahead and type that in the chat, what your, what your thoughts are. Right, it, it goes all the way up to the second floor. And, and, and it's even on that curve. She uses that curve to her advantage. Yeah. You have to look up, right. It's like, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Overwhelming, surrounding the viewer like a wave of, right. It's over, right, daunting. Those are great opinions, great suggestions. Great comments. The mural has uh, three layers that are stacked and it gets the viewer to gaze upwards and we'll discuss each one individually. And then we'll join as a group and look at it as a whole.
the artist uses music notes a lot in her work. And really it says something about, you know, her actually using her voice to call attention to important matters. But it also, it provides a visual structure in the composition. From the museum website in Stacking Traumas, the musical notes have been manipulated and elongated to represent the form of three stacked tables positioned on top of each other in horizontal lines that represent beams, beams used in musical notations. Mm -hmm. Beams connect the stems of the consecutive notes to form a rhythmic grouping that makes the sheet music easier to read. These extended horizontal lines recall the musical staff and sheet music and are used in visual representations of Kim's voice. In each of the five bars, a staff represents a different level of music pitch. The first note she plays are words representing something and every, every person with hearing loss is familiar with. It's the dinner table syndrome. And we've included a short video of a deaf person's perspective on the subject. Often when I think of my family getting together for events, I often think of our gatherings during the holidays. And we follow the dialogical rules in hearing conversations. Everyone pretty much spoke when they had something to say, which meant the conversations between my family members often overlapped. It was really difficult for me to understand. And I'd say, what, what? And I was focusing on who was speaking at that moment. Now we have advanced assistive technology that enables us to live caption conversations. But if I had that growing up, my family would have not liked that idea of having a laptop at the table during dinner time. There was often a lot of confusion. I'd wanna know what was going on in people's lives. I wish we had this technology 10 or 20 years ago. Deaf people are often proven to experience high levels of anxiety compared to hearing people. Compared to hearing people, deaf people experience a high level of anxiety. Also, they also are more likely to be a victim of abuse or violence as, a well, as well as a high rate of unemployment. These notes may resonate strongly with many and it's understandable. All the barriers and frustrations that deaf people face, to, it makes it hard to have inner peace. Here's a quote from a deaf storyteller on this subject. My anxiety is always very much connected to my hearing. Every day when I step outside the front door, I immediately put up a wall. I use earbuds to deflect a world I can't hear. If people see the earbuds, they can't get mad at me for not hearing something. I feel awkward walking around without music playing. And I always have to be more alert. I feel as though I'm always being watched. If I miss people saying something, they look at me and go, why didn't they respond? I know I'm being paranoid, but I can't shut it off. I'm constantly scanning the room, 
trying to not miss what's important. It's exhausting. So that can relate to either of those layers, the dinner table syndrome, hearing people anxiety, it can relate to either of those. And if you'd like, feel free to share in the chat any of your comments or reactions to that piece. Feel free. Melissa said, both, I can relate to both, yeah. So lastly, we'll look at the biggest nightmare that has plagued the deaf community and caused a great deal of outrage and disagreement. Alexander Graham Bell or AGB. Alexander Graham Bell is best known as the inventor of the telephone. Everyone learns that in fourth grade or something, right? What is lesser known is that his wife and mother were both deaf. Alexander Graham Bell, or AGB, became involved in teaching deaf children and developed the philosophy and ideology that deaf children should, be taught to, should not be taught to sign. They should only communicate orally by speaking and reading lips, supplemented by sound amplification. This philosophy is harmful to the deaf community for a variety of reasons, but most notably the impact on deaf education in America. Consider the two schools for the deaf in St. Louis. Central Institute for the Deaf, CID, and Moog School. Both continue to champion Alexander Graham Bell's ideas and have considerable impact on the deaf community in St. Louis. If children are not taught sign, then they are likely to become isolated and to suffer and to not have a pride in, in their identity. Are there any thoughts anyone would like to share? All right. Thank you for looking at this amazing work of art. We are so fortunate to be able to enjoy this mural in St. Louis during Deaf Awareness Month and during DVAF, Deaf Visual Arts Festival. Here is a short time-lapse video of artist Scott Pondrum installing the mural over a five day period. Christine's son, Kim, collaborated with the museum extensively on designing this project and envisioning the message it would share. But since she resides in Germany, she did not physically come here to paint it. All right, moving on.
This artwork is by a Native American artist. And I'm curious before I introduce this piece or in, share more information about this piece, I'm curious what your reaction is initially. What do you notice? Cultural appropriation. All right. How a culture, how cultural, uh, how cultural appropriation affects people. Okay. What other things do you notice about this piece? Ah, the movement of birds. Makes me think of the land acknowledgement Meredith did at the beginning of the indigenous people. We're forced from here. Mm -hmm. I noticed that the word natural is inverted. Yeah, oh, good eye. Somebody just put that in the chat. Artists often, often use that. And it's a specific way of calling attention to um, land use um, by like signage outside, used outside. It'll also often take the name of a place and then reverse it or invert it. Mm -hmm. This artist has two names. Hoke E I V. and Hachivi. The artist's heritage is Cheyenne and Arapaho. They were born in 1954. And this work has a really interesting title, Telling Many Magpies Telling Blackbird, Telling Havachi, Hachibi. So it's telling, then telling, and telling. And this relates to oral, the oral tradition of sharing culture. And the swarm of magpies relates to his great, great, great grandfather, who was himself a Cheyenne chief. And also Blackbird himself was the artist's great grandfather. So that heritage is communicated in this piece. And you notice a swarm of magpies, it gives the piece texture and emotion. The artist calls your attention to the recognition of Native Americans as a living people. Can you think of any examples of um, of any mascots or places um, well let's say product that use Indian names they're really 
common in popular culture. So we have one here, Squaw Valley. Oh, a butter. Mm. Yeah. I need, what about sports? Oh, Chiefs. Yeah. Thank you, Kai. Good one. So the point of his work has always been to call for recognition of Native American people and not to ignore and to continue to use what is ancestrally theirs and that we have appropriated to not continue that pattern. And it's interesting because that ancestral storytelling, which is in Native American culture, is really common within deaf culture as well. Our deaf culture greatly values storytelling as well. Storytellers are always highly respected within the community. All right. So this says, we don't want Indians, just their names, mascots. Can you see his brush strokes here? It's interesting. This is actually not a painting, it's a print. And it's really big. And it's a full size picture within a room. And we'll give you a, a shot of that next. You can see what it looks like inside the museum on display. Yeah, right there. So it's a really tall piece. When I was standing next to it, I would say I might have gone halfway up the piece. So it's really, really large. Are there any other comments before we move on? I think we have time for one more. It's really beautiful in person. I'll let you all know. Uh, do we have time for one more? Ms. Lehman? Yeah, okay. So this one is really my favorite one, I have to tell you. Um, it's amazing to see this in person. And it was on display before. I don't think it is there anymore. So this painting is in oil. And it's uh, the, in, in pigment. And it's on six individual pieces of paper that are stacked. And then it was painted. Uh, painted, let's see, black. And then with the, the oil on there, which it's the gessoed paper. Eighteen to twenty plaza inferno grid. Uh, 
So I'm just curious, what word or phrase or what comes into your mind when you see this piece of art? Hmm. All right. Yeah, construction, slums, falling, ghosts, ah. smoke. Yeah, the building looks like it's on fire. Really, that's interesting. Uh, it's a, an interesting brush technique, actually, that it's painted upwards. And when you, it's interesting, you can look uh, like see through the window, like you see through this world. I want to tell you a little bit about the art. And basically, what's important about this. His name is, just a moment, Gary S Simmons. He's an African-American artist and he was born in 1964. And he made this in 2008 during the presidential election. And uh, there was a lot of conflict and confusion going on at that time. And it was related to race and, and that's what it was related to. And a lot of contradictions. So the building was inspired by the movie that you see, have you seen, it's Planet of the Apes. If you've seen, have you seen that movie? Well, if you haven't seen the movie, um, it has some really unfortunate representations of black people. And it called attention to the danger of stereotypes. And that's still happening and in, in popular in our culture today. So really, it, it pays attention and focuses on social. Situations. So if there's any comments, or if you want to go in more in depth about this work. Okay, we got time for one more and then question and answers. Okay. This artist is a just, she's American Indian and she's from Canada. The name is, is Anishable, born in 1960. This work is really a photograph of a performance artist. And she's standing there with the orange coat, with the cross on the back, against this huge wall. It's a, it's a construction zone.
So how the artist has done this perspective, you see the orange all the way around. It's, it's really bright orange. Makes her invisible, except for the X. I just recently learned something really, there's a really important uh, message behind the X. So a long time ago, when the tribes were brought to uh, the Americas and the Europeans got together, they, they signed an agreement, the treaty, um, that the Indians, they couldn't read English. So it was signed with the simple X. And then the next generation, they all knew that the agreement would be dissolved. They wouldn't follow it. So the construction zone could really um, represent what we call gentrification. And that's like taking over the area and the land and, and putting buildings on the land. And they, they made, they took advantage of the poor people that couldn't afford to live there. And the American Indians had to move. So the art really makes a strong correlation to the body, the land, the language to the Native Americans. I really like how she looked to the past generations and standing and looking at what's happened today. It calls attention to the past and the present and what we're facing is such a huge problem. And it shows that what the people are going through through the art. Okay, the last one. Orange means warning, danger, emergency. Mm -hmm. Are we done? Tony says, hello. Yeah, thanks for taking us on the tour through the Kemper Museum. Okay. Um, let's see, I have some questions. Someone wanted to know about CSK and their art program and was wondering, uh, about the Divya art. Merit is saying, what, what does Divya mean? Is that what you're saying, Tony? Maybe I could answer that one. Okay, D-E-V-I. Yeah, this is Tony here. I'll go ahead and take care of that. Divya, it's a deaf manifesto, deaf visual arts manifesto that um, community, the artists within the community, deaf artists, um, children of deaf adults, also referred to as CODAs, and other artists within the community uh, is them sharing their quote unquote deaf experience. And they all developed this manifesto that is the deaf experience within their artwork, which it will be, yeah. And Christine Sun Kim, her stacking traumas artwork I believe would definitely be considered Divya because it is communicating the deaf experience. All right, 
what else do we have here in the Q&A? Let me look for another question. Oh, people are putting them in the chat, not in a Q&A. So let me see here. We'll take some more questions. If you have any, uh, any questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A there at the bottom of the screen. So the Kemper Art Museum, I have a question myself. Is it open for in-person viewing right now? Meredith? Is the museum open? Hi, yes. Uh, the museum is open. I'm trying to start my video right now. Um, the museum is open to the public. And we are open uh, Mondays and then Wednesday to Sunday from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. There I am. I can put a link in the chat um, for more information. And is there admission? Great. Is there, there an admission fee? There is no call? admission. It's free um, to, to visit the museum. All right, great. I know a lot of people from St. Louis would like to be able to experience Christine Sun Kim's work in person. So I've heard from uh, other people that have already been able to see the piece in person and they were quite astounded. Um, they couldn't really describe the feeling that came from being able to see that mural in person. So pictures seemingly don't quite do it justice as far as that, that piece of artwork goes. So I think uh, while it's in person, while it's available to see in person, definitely wanna take advantage of that. Uh, and Meredith Lehman, um, again, are you there? <laughs> yes. So Christine Sun Kim, um, her stacking traumas, how long will that be on display there at the Kemper Art Museum? Yes, the um, Christine Sun Kim's mural will be on view through um, the end of this year and until January 31st of 2022. All right, and just one second, let me look here. Okay, so we've got, here's another question. Um, some people have been asking if all of the artists for these pieces are deaf. No, just Christine. So the other two are people of color, correct? That's right, yes. Okay. All right, and keeping an eye on the chat and Q&A here, I do not see any other questions. I, I have a question, I have a question. Oh, okay. Yeah. So if we prepared a small group and got together and we could go visit the museum, I just wonder who would be interested in joining the group? And you can all uh, feel free to put your answers in the chat so we can, we can see them. Thank you so much for this, uh, coming with me on this tour as this is my first time. Yeah, and uh, Tony here as director of the Deaf Visual Arts Festival, DVAF. I know for the last, uh, two years, we have been virtual now. The festival has been because of, you know, COVID here. We are hoping though, 
someday we will be back in person for the festival. At the same time, um, I really would like to set up a program where deaf docents, um, deaf tour guides are able to, there's programming that provides, you know, deaf tour guides or deaf docents for the local museums here in St. Louis. And that there can be that, you know, direct one-on-one -on -one tour rather than having to go through an interpreter to experience a tour for the, to you know, interact with a docent. So having an American Sign Language tour in person would be, would be great. So, and I think it might be the first program of its kind within St. Louis if that were to happen. So, and we're starting here, so this is great. And there will of course be some trials and tribu tribulations along the way, but we've started it now. And uh, I look forward to seeing how this develops for the deaf and hard of hearing uh, community in the area. So again, Thank you to everyone in the audience for participating this evening. And I would like to thank uh, Meredith Gray Green. I appreciate your time functioning as our deaf docent here and your studying of these artists and sharing your, your thoughts and providing this discussion here for uh, the museum. And also Meredith Lehman, thank you for all of the time that you have spent and allowing us some um, to have this opportunity to experience some of the artwork that is within the museum. Again, thank you. Thank you very much. So, all right. And also we need to thank all of our sponsors and we have a lot of sponsors. Let me see here. Thank you, Nancy. Sorry, it's taking me a minute to get there. I have too many windows open. Can't see one for the other. Uh, we need to recognize and thank the National um, RIT, the uh, Rochester Institute for Technology and NTID, National Technical Institute for the Deaf, Missouri Arts Commission, uh, MCDHH, Missouri Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing, Gallaudet University, Communication Services of the Deaf, uh, CSD, and Sorenson Video Relay Service, and Convo. So we'd like to thank all of those who have contributed to this program um, to making it possible this evening. And I would like to thank everyone here. All right, great job. Uh, someone asked me recently if this would, this recording would be uploaded and this recording will be uploaded. Um, if you could just give us a few days to get everything together, it will be available. And there will be a link available on the Deaf Visual Arts Festival page. So if you want to take a look at our calendar that we have available, that link will become available so that you can link to the recording via YouTube. All right. Okay. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, and uh, have a good evening. Good night. Good night. So See you later. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.